Welcome here, and uh, welcome especially to our cynics who think this is very gimmicky. Uh, so did we when we started. Uh, the background to this is very brief. A couple of years back, in fact about 10 years ago, I was teaching a course, Forensic Investigation, which I've been teaching for about 15 years at my previous university. And uh, at the same time, I was doing a textbook for Oxford University Press on the law of evidence in South Africa. Um, which is a dirty word now with the lines of the local reps, but they does not matter. Um, what happened was we came across this technology and got in touch with the originator, Dr. Farwell, in the United States, and I included a chapter on the technology in the textbook. And Oxford wasn't happy about this because, you know, the conservative they don't want to put gimmicky stuff in their books. So I then asked them to do a peer review to check it out to see whether it was sufficiently established to put at least in as a chapter for discussion. And they then, after checking it out, agreed to put it in, and it went into the book. Uh, but it, it remained an interest of mine because it sort of struck me that if you look at DNA technology, which was discovered in 1953, the structure of DNA, and it took 20 years in 1988 to get into courts for the first time that it seems that the law, apart from being very expensive, is also very slow. And um, I see Eel there as well. Can join us in the uh, So what we then did when we got here is we got some colleagues, Dr. Richard Jones, who introduced himself in a moment, Professor Richard Jones, and Deborah Wilson, one of my colleagues who specializes in neuroscience. And we made a couple of suggestions of turning this into a project New Zealand based. And one thing about New Zealand is that it doesn't have the various layers of administration that it goes through. It's a pretty flat management structure. So, no time at all when people were interested, the police were interested, they came on board, the prison came on board, and there was a lot of enthusiasm to investigate this new technology. We then had a project that we developed, um, the British Brain Richard Analysis Project. And what we're going to give you tonight is an overview of the project and what our findings are so far. Um, when we started the project, we needed a couple of experts expert in neurotechnology, neuroengineering, <laughs> medical side, um, some of the psychology stuff, and we found it all in one man. Mr. Richard Jones, a junk professor in about five faculties, so we need one man to do everything. <laughs> and then we got <coughs> Neumann sitting over here, who will introduce himself as well, who we became part of the project as well, as a specialist in psychology, and of course Deborah as well. So at this stage, my background is in law and in forensic investigation. My name is Robert Palmer, and co leaders of the project myself. Deborah and uh, Richard as well, and crucial part also we played by Evo Roman. So if I can just ask Richard to introduce himself and Deborah, and then we'll start. Okay, um, <clears throat> well Robin has already introduced me, so I'm a sort of mixture of a, a neuroengineer and a neuroscientist. Um, so I'm primarily based at the New Zealand Brain Research Institute uh, here in town, uh, but I've also got uh, positions in psychology uh, at the university here and here there's a few partners that happens. Um, so I've got lots of PhD students for that sort of thing. Um, and so yeah, I'm yeah. Robin welcomed me to, to this project and uh, I can say it really is quite quite something. So we'll, we'll come back to that shortly. Deborah. I'm Debbie Wilson, I'm with the law school here. Uh, my real interest is in criminal law and also medical law, so anything that kind of crosses the boundary between the two really gets my attention. So I'm really interested in looking at how we regulate new technologies. So when scientists give us something, how does that, how do lawyers actually address some of the issues that arise in that? So that's my main focus. Ewald. My name's Ewald Newman. I work at the psychology department, and I've been working with Richard, and we have been designing experiments to explore this uh, technology and see how uh, 
memory factors affect, potentially affect the great energy they have. Thank you very much. Now, before I start, I need uh, about three or four volunteers <coughs> who I want to, we're not going to do a full experiment, it's just to illustrate the point. So, three or four volunteers to come down, just have a look under the jacket because um, it's relevant to what we do next. So, anybody who is, yes, come through. How do you go to good memory? <laughs> Two more? You don't get paid for it, unfortunately, but some. Two, two more? Yeah, come through. I'm now going to ask volunteer A, you volunteer A, to look at what's under the jacket, which is actually a drawer for our purposes. Okay. So you see, we can have a glass of that. Of course. Yeah, got that? Number eight, D, come through. Right. Very good. All right. Volunteer C, come through. Very good. You're ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we've got three volunteers. The fourth one? That it? Three will have to do. Thank you very much. A, B, and C may take a seat. Okay. Now, the reason I made them do that is let's assume that you are all potential thieves sitting here. And if you look deep down into your soul, you know you are potentially a thief. And let's assume as well that my cell phone, which I left here earlier, got stolen from underneath that jacket. That therefore means that whatever is underneath that jacket, which for our purposes is really a drawer in the room, um, only the thief would know what was underneath the jacket, that is what was in the drawer, because the cell phone was worth a number of items. And for our purposes, we call those items underneath the jacket probes. You'll see just now when we get a little more technical, and when Christian gets really technical, you need to remember these terms. They're called probes. In other words, only the person, only the person who stole the cell phone would also know what else was in that drawer and what kind of cell phone it was. Okay? We all got that. They're all probes. Now all of you, can I ask you just to look around this theater? Uh, you'll see there are two entrances. There's a little man indicating an exit there. Yeah. There's a clock up on top there. Um, there are two projectors or two screens with uh, a number of lights in the front here. There are two projectors at the top there. There's a table in the corner, there's a chair. Now all of you sitting here, if you were in the theater, would have seen all this information. And they are what we call a target information, the stuff you wouldn't know because you were here. Alright? But that doesn't mean that you stole my cell phone, does it? But three of you know what's under the three of you look in the drawer. And one of those three, A, B, or C, stole the cell phone. Now the point is: can we use technology? Can we see where we can consider what's inside your brain? to determine who looked in the drawer? That's the real question. We're not going to say that person's a thief, but at least we can narrow down the field of suspects to a number of people who actually looked in the drawer. Because they have knowledge of the stuff in the drawer, either in the drawer or those probes in their brain. Okay, so in other words, what Rich is going to illustrate later, and everything's going to draw on a case law, is <coughs> Can we get a light on your possibly? Anybody know how to do that? <coughs> okay, there we go. So in other words, what I'm going to give is three colors. Blue. <coughs> red. And green. These are 
indicators of the three brain waves we're going to be dealing with. Now, the, for our purposes, um, the people, the stuff in the drawer, the five or six items in the drawer under the jacket are the red ones, they call probes. The green ones is information you all know. What's in the theater? The table, the table, loudspeaker, screens, the size of the theater, the counter at the front, you all know that. They are called targets. So everybody knows what the targets are. And the blue, sorry, um, Fairbanks, Alaska, um, the Main Street, how many bars on the Main Street? You may have just been there. Fairbanks, Alaska. I won't choose the wrong person. <laughs> the point is, in setting up this experiment, you they also choose a lot of things which are irrelevant to the entire incident. And incidents in Alaska or what happens in the South Pacific, so those are all irrelevant. Number of questions that are not relevant to the experiment. And in simple, simple terms, what I want you to remember, because it can be very complicated, is that when somebody does the brain test and they know nothing about what they see on the screen, the image or the picture or the word or the description, then in simple terms, the EEG, the electrical impulse, or sort of flat line. Okay, simplifying and breaking now, but you get flat lining if you know nothing about it. If you recognize it, so all of you sitting here, if I gave you a test, that's, sorry, it's the wrong one. See, it was a test for you and you all failed. <laughs> you know nothing about it? Of course, the flat lines are irrelevant, correct? But all of you sitting here, if I gave you a test and asked you how big is the auditorium, how many screens does it have, what does the exit look like, what does the front area look like, is there a universal temporary uh, uh, badge over here, you'll all get that right. And therefore, every time I ask you something of that nature, it will peak. When you recognize it. Alright? So it's almost like a mountain peak, an aha moment, because it's recognized. And you can see where we're going with this. It therefore means that if, and this is if the technology works, which we're just going to do in some detail, if it works, it means that if we intersperse the probes, these items under the jacket, among all the questions, those of you who did not see the probes, you're going to match the irrelevance, aren't you? Those of you who saw the probes, and it's in your brain because it's recognized, one would expect the probes would then match the targets. Great. That's in simple terms how it works. So the interpretation is, do the probes match the targets? If they do, you've got some explaining to do. It doesn't mean you're guilty. You may have innocent knowledge of it. It's not a lie detector. It's a knowledge detector. We may infer you lying if you're lying and anything about it. But the point is, if the targets match the probes, then you have that in your brain. That's the point of the brain. And it's based on P300 brain waves, which is a recognized medical science. Uh, it's not something new. And so that's where we are with that. Okay. Keep that in mind because the next illustration will see where we're going from here. All right. Um, the next point is just to say then that it's a knowledge detector, not a uh, lie detector. So. Traditionally, law had enough of truth verifiers. 
Just a little bit. Okay, number two is third one. Uh, torture used to be one of the favorite ones. Not very reliable. Probability assessments. And we are still using truth verification as they used it 2,000 years ago in the Roman times. We tried to put judges and sit there and try and guess what is more probable versus what we're told. That's why we get so many wrong convictions. That's why we get so many appeals over two. Because one judge's case may be different to another judge's case and what's probable and what's not. So it's not very good. So any science we can use that can help us determine the truth will be welcomed with open arms. Two troubles of that, two problems of that. Science takes a long time for the course to accept it. DNA took a long time. And the three main scientific applications that will be used for lie detection are polygraphs, so-called lie detectors, functional MRIs, and then this forensic brain wave analysis. And uh, very briefly, the distinction between the three is the polygraph, you get strapped up in a chair like that, and your physiological responses, sweating, blood pressure, anxiety, uh, breathing, heart rate, all that is tested. And then the inference is drawn that because you're anxious and your heart rate has gone up on certain questions, you're therefore lying on those questions. Now, I'm not, we're not here to look at the pros and cons of polygraphs, but you know, and I know, I have to see a police guard already if you're guilty. Well, my heart rate goes up. So, put me in a chair and start asking me questions, I may very well be very anxious, which I have done a couple of tests this major. So, the Courts are not happy to take the inference that because your anxiety levels are up and your blood rate's up, therefore you're lying. It's used in investigation by the states, but the inference from the technology to the conclusion of lying is just too much of a jump. Okay? The other one which is widely used, and companies in the United States dealing with it, functional magnetic resonance imaging, MRIs, that works on the basis that when your brain is active, the flow of oxygenated blood through the brain can be measured or pictured from above with a brain scan. And the inference, therefore, is that if I just stop there for a second, may I ask what your name is? Scott. Scott. Okay. Now you said Scott. They didn't take much thinking of to say Scott because he knows his name. Therefore, there would not be much brain work going on. That's it, almost immediate. But if you make up, make up another name. What's your name? Right. Okay. If you're making up another name, what happens then is that you must decide on the line. Your brain does not work now. Okay, I'm going to make up another line that says it's usually delay. You always say Joe Myers. Secondly, your prefrontal cortex, the red part there, is active because it now looks at the consequences of this lie. Are you lying? What will happen in my life? And then you make the decision to lie and you give it name. So this technology says that because you can see a lot of blood flow to your prefrontal cortex, the front part of the brain, when you make the decisions, therefore we draw the inference you're lying about a simple question. It has worked in some cases, but again, if you know about this, as you ask the question, you can start thinking of Newton's equations and things, create a lot of activity there, and therefore they draw the wrong conclusion. Right? Whereas this technology, forensic brainwave, is pure EEG technology. In other words, it merely tests your response on an EEG, medical EEG, when you respond, that creates a P300 brainwave, three hundredths of a second part of the, of the stimulus. And after that happens, you can virtually not suppress it. So if it does a peak, you know about it, that part, you don't know about it. So the inference <coughs> the drawn is a lot stronger than on the other two technologies. Okay. So that's the background. Three big cases, which Debbie are dealing with uh, uh, origin? Okay. 
three big US cases were the ones that created the general awareness of this technology. First is J.B. Grinder. J.B. Grinder was a serial killer. For legal reasons, they couldn't take a picture from the front. That's him sitting there from the back. Jerry Farwell, I mean, sorry, Larry Farwell, I'm getting confused with Jerry Springer here. Uh, Larry Farwell, the developer of the technology, is Kesslingen. And J.B. Grinder was being investigated as a serial killer for a number of murders in the United States. He denied he had anything to do with it, and the police didn't have enough to put on it. So the police or the sheriff said to him, listen, are you prepared to do this test to prove you have no knowledge of these other cases, the other deaths? And he, as a really psychopath, being a bit arrogant, said, no problem, we'll take the test. And he failed it horribly. Every one of the cases he was tested on showed he had full knowledge of those deaths. And when confronted with this, he confessed and he was then convicted. Now, the legal aspects of that is something we're looking at. It was a secret, doubtful whether uh, he was fully informed of his rights. But there doesn't seem to be such a big problem in many states and other states nowadays. <laughs> now, you, you told your rights once you're in your coffin. <laughs> Possibly. He startled me. <laughs> All right. So, Brian approved. From a prosecution point of view, he was guilty of a serial killer. The most famous case is America's kind of horror. Gary Harrington um, was arrested for murder. What had happened is an ex policeman was killed, and the leader, the suspect, was scapegoated very quickly. So they arrested a youngster, very much like the making of a murder situation, very much like a kind of horror, a 16 year old and said to him, if you don't tell us who did this, or give us a name, they didn't care who it was because the election depended on a conviction. In the United States, in many cases, the sheriff, the police chief is elected, is not appointed. And the youngster said, yes, it was X. And then they went and tried to find X, and they found X was sitting in jail. They came back and said, no, no, put the X is in jail, give me another name. And he then came up with Terry Harrington. And Harrington was then convicted and sentenced to 30 years in jail for the murder. Lucky he didn't get the death penalty. But he always protested his innocence. And after being in jail for almost 20 years, he, he heard through his lawyer about this technology and then begged Farwell to come test it. Farwell then came over and tested Harrington, both on the incident of the death of the policeman at the used car lot, who was working as a security guard at the time. And on his other body, because he was sitting at a ball game with his friends and his family, and they all confirmed this. And of course, they said, of course, you confirm it, friends and family. And Richard's going to deal with the results of that case. I won't deal with it. Point is, according to Farwell, he was convinced that Harrington had no knowledge of this incident. They went to the High Supreme Court, High Court first, and in the, for the very first time, this evidence was allowed into the High Court. Um, and then subsequently to the Supreme Court, and Harrington was acquitted. Now, he wasn't acquitted because of the brainwave technology. The courts were too afraid to rely on that. I'm sure they were persuaded by it, but they relied on the violation of Harrington's constitutional rights. Because when the youngster was shown this evidence, he recanted and said the police forced him to give him a name. He was then already. 30, so he didn't care that much anymore. And that's what he did because he didn't want to go to jail himself. And at the doors of the Supreme Court in the United States, they withdrew. Eventually paid Harrington $12.5 million for compensation. He was completely and utterly innocent, no doubt about it. Interestingly enough, in the court papers, that's Harrington leading court in the days of the <coughs> In the court papers, interestingly enough, the prosecutors and sometimes the police sometimes don't care about justice, and that's a worldwide phenomenon. They care about winning and their careers. So they did not want to concede. And in their court papers, which I saw, there's one amazing allegation saying that no one in the United States, this is in the prosecution's court papers before it hit the courts, nobody in the United States has a right not to be framed. 
<laughs> in black and white. And I think the attorney who looked at the accept himself, there's no way he's going to argue this before the Supreme Court. You settle this matter. Right. Anyway, you can see the parallels with those who are familiar with the town of four effects. If we had this technology at that time, I think we would have uh, he also served 20 years. We could have had a different result than that, in my view. All right. So those are the two big cases. But there was a bit. This was 2003. Then in 2005, we had a bit of a reverse. Jimmy Ray Swartios. <coughs> the same uh, technology was used. Swartios was shown to have no knowledge at all about the murders of his ex and the daughter. But somebody had to pay for that. You know, it's a terrible thing to kill a 29 year old woman and a daughter. Somebody had to pay. And they had to find somebody they had slaughtered. And when they go in, they rejected. The courts didn't allow the evidence to be admitted. And slaughter was executed. And Farwell was convinced that an innocent man was executed. I am of the opinion, and the psychologists here can perhaps look into that. I am of the opinion that the man had the wrong surname. <laughs> you don't know the friend T. Slaughter, it's very easy for your brain to make a connection. This person must be a serial killer. <laughs> but anyway, that's another avenue of investigation. But I think it was a travesty of justice. So, having said that, um, what we're going to show you is a little 10 minute video quickly, which illustrates a case study, an actual experiment done by Farwell, based on a theft case in the United States. We'll just summarize what we've done before we go on to our colleagues. And it happened in Fairfield, Iowa. Uh, it's called the Met Case Death Experiment. So we'll show that to you and then we'll go on to my colleagues. So just give me a second to actually get them. When a person first hears about brain fingerprint or sees we put a headband on somebody's head and we can tell if they're an FBI agent, we can tell if they're a terrorist, we can tell if they've committed a crime, it sounds as if, well, maybe we're reading minds or something of that nature. Brain fingerprinting is not mind reading. It's a very straightforward scientific procedure and all we can tell, we can't download the contents of your brain, all we can tell is does a person recognize these specific details? as significant in this context. We have to know exactly what we're looking for. Okay, in this test you'll see an item that one of the suspects was wearing when he was apprehended. Brain fingerprinting is a fascinating application of a well-established science. Ready? Essentially, it is a multiple choice test given to the brain, where each option elicits a brain wave response. That response is then recorded and analyzed by Dr. Farwell. We don't have a choice about making these particular responses. When something significant comes up that we notice, the brain is going to say, aha, aha, yeah, that's something important to me. As a way of testing the technology, Innovation asked Dr. Farwell to conduct a blind test using a crime that had been committed on a farm near the town of Fairfield, Iowa. The police caught a perpetrator in the act of committing a robbery. He pled guilty to that crime and served two years in jail. Dr. Farwell was given the police reports, but was not told who had committed the crime. Four volunteers were asked to participate in the test. Dr. Farwell did not meet any of them before they were brain fingerprinted. 
The four subjects were told no details of the crime. They were not told where it happened or what was stolen. One of them, however, was the guilty man and knew what had taken place. Now you understand today we're going to be measuring your brainwaves. Yes. And we're going to determine whether there's certain information stored in your brain about a particular crime that's been committed. Yes. All right? So you'll see words. You'll push a button in response to each word, one button or the other, and I'll tell you which one. And you'll have a headband on your head that's going to be measuring your brainwaves. In any good scientific test, there are control and experimental groups. In essence, things we know measured against things we want to find out. The same is true in brain fingerprinting. Dr. Farwell presents a subject with three different kinds of information, or stimuli. The first are the control group, what he calls targets. Targets contain information that we know the subject knows. There are details about the crime that we tell him. He may have learned those from some other source as well, but we're sure that he knows the targets. The purpose of the targets is to get a brain response that indicates that in fact, yes, the subject does recognize this. Yes, he does know this. Targets are going to be the control group for a positive response. So Dr. Farwell must make sure that the subjects recognize these stimuli. He does so by providing them to each subject just before he administers the test. Let me see, all right? Okay, read them to yourself. All right. So these are the ones that you're going to have to know, okay? All right. You're going to have to be able to recognize these when they come up on the screen, and they'll flash very briefly on the screen. So in other words, you're going to know what the correct answer is in some of those lists. So take a look at this and make sure you know them and you'll be able to recognize them. Once a subject has read the targets, his brain should fire a spark of recognition when they are presented during the brain fingerprinting test. The second kind of stimuli are what Dr. Farwell calls irrelevance. They are the control stimuli for no recognition response. Irrelevant stimuli are words or phrases or pictures that are irrelevant to the person. They have nothing to do with the crime. They're not significant to the person. They're just, they're things he doesn't know, things that he won't find significant. And that gives us a standard for information that he doesn't know. So if irrelevance are Dr. Farwell's yardstick to measure no recognition, it's essential that the subjects not know those stimuli. And the best way to ensure that is to simply make them up. The third kind of stimuli Dr. Farwell calls probes. Probes contain information that is relevant to the crime, but that the person has no way of knowing if he wasn't at the crime. Probes are the experimental group, those stimuli that only the individual who committed the crime could reasonably know. Dr. Farwell selects them from the police reports. We flash probes mixed in with other things that would be equally plausible for somebody who doesn't know about the crime. If the individual was there, he'll know which is the right option, and his brain will say, aha, that's it. If he wasn't there, he'll see grain bins, he'll see office building, he'll see storefront. He won't know which is the right item, and he won't get that kind of aha recognition response. So each of the four subjects knows the targets. They don't know the irrelevance and Dr. Farwell will attempt to find out which one of them will recognize the probes. In this test, you're going to see an item that one of the suspects was wearing when he was apprehended, an item that was in the possession of the suspects when they were apprehended, the item the suspects were stealing, and where the crime was committed, the kind of place, dwelling, or establishment. Okay, just relax, look at the center of the screen. We ran 30 different tests, and each one of them lasted for four minutes. And during each one of them, he saw three targets, three probes, and 12 irrelevance. And he saw each of those several times for a total of between two and 3,000 stimuli that were presented. And we measured the response a number of times, and then we averaged those. 
like it. In this case, the local law enforcement authorities were trying to catch somebody who was running a methamphetamine lab. So the people who were running this meth lab were stealing anhydrous ammonia from a particular location on a farm. The authorities staked out this location and they caught two suspects in the act of attempting to steal anhydrous ammonia from these tanks. Stealing anhydrous ammonia was one of the probe stimuli. That was what the crime was. This grain bin was another probe stimuli. It was a, a landmark that they would have had to seen to have been here. Also, what the perpetrators did at the time of the crime. There was a sequence of events where they got out of the car, they brought with them a flashlight that were used as probe stimuli. With knowledge of the crime, Dr. Farwell was able to come up with very specific probes but it remains to be seen whether these probes would reveal the perpetrator. Okay, these are data for subject D. At this point, we presented the stimulus. This is 1.6 seconds later, so this axis is time. And this is voltage. So you can see there is a voltage increase and then decrease. The targets represented by the red line he clearly recognized those. That's no surprise. We knew he would. We told him what they were. The irrelevance are represented by the green line, and he doesn't get that marked response to the irrelevance. The critical question here is, does he recognize the probes? Now, the probes clearly go right along with the irrelevance. The blue line matches the green line. So what that means is that those probes, those details about this specific crime, were irrelevant to that particular subject. Okay, this is Mr. B. This is the second subject who came in. Again, he recognizes these targets. There is a very clear peak that takes place in the red line. He's recognizing the targets. And then he doesn't recognize the irrelevance. You don't see that recognition response to the green line. Here in this case, however, this blue line represents the probes. Those are details about the crime that we didn't tell him but clearly his brain recognized those details about the crime. Subjects A, C, and D did not know the significant details of the crime. Subject B had a very clear record of the significant details of the crime stored in his brain that he had no other way of knowing other than committing the crime. It was, in fact, Subject B who had been caught in the act of stealing anhydrous ammonia from this farm just outside of Fairfield, Iowa. It was Subject B who had pled guilty to this crime, as Dr. Farwell was able to determine from his brain fingerprinting test. So, Richard, what did you think of it? Okay, so you've had a good introduction to this forensic brainwave analysis, um, and I want to give you a, a, a basically a closer look at that, um, the technical aspects of it, not great detail. Um, but basically, it's all 
based around these things called event-related potentials, which are generated by our brain in response to some stimulus. But th so these, these are the, uh, this is what we're after here. This, um, this is an e event-related potential. Um, but basically, this is like, you can see there, this is five microvolts, so it's very small part of the brain. And what it is, it's embedded up in, uh, within the EEG, which is this one here. So that's the ongoing electrical activity in our brain, which is much bigger. It can be about 50 to 100 microvolts. So you can't, if you just look at the EEG itself, you can't see these ERPs. So what you've got to do is you've got to take, do a whole lot of these stimuli, get a whole lot of these responses, and you do, you average away. So this is this process where you can do this averaging of lots of responses. And when you do that, all of a sudden you find that the background EEG disappears and you get this event-related potential sort of being pulled out. But you've got to average quite a few of them. So this is another look at the event-related potential. So you get these things uh, from all sorts of stimuli. One is a sort of sensory stimuli. So if we get a visual pattern presented to our to our brain, we get this this uh, potential generated at the back of our brain, the visual cortex. And this is really the early part of this N1 part here. Then so you get this the sensory responses occurring. Then you get perceptual processes occurring later on in the brain, and then you get this big one here, which is the P300 or P3 at about 300 milliseconds after the, when the stimulus is fired here, and it's in relation to recognition and decision making and the cognition to do with this whole process. So the thing about this P300 is that it really doesn't rely upon the physical attributes of whatever the stimulus were. It relies upon the reaction reaction of the person to whatever that stimulus was that they recognize in some context which is very important so this it's this particular waveform here which is really the key to this forensic brainwave analysis and here's an example over here um, where they it's the standard what's called an oddball paradigm in which you have a whole stream of zeros being presented on a screen and all of a sudden just occasionally you get this X coming up Whenever you get the X, you get this this big sort of P300 sort of response, or oh, there's something sort of uh, come up which is which is different. It relies on that principle. Now, this has died as far as the slide changing is concerned. Um, so this moves us on to uh, forensic brainwave analysis, and basically. So forensic brainwave analysis uses these event-related potentials to see whether there is this concealed information in the brain. And so basically it allows us to see, is the information there or is it not? So we get the, the, these ERPs and we can take them out to as long as we like. Um, now Larry was tending to go out to 900 milliseconds here and that's the sort of standard P300 test but you can go a bit longer than that if you so wish, and there's a good reason for that, as we'll show later on. And he called this the, the P300 plus murmur. It doesn't matter too much what it is, but it's just, it's just basically taking more of a response. So forensic brainwave analysis, there are lots of protocols around, and uh, one that Larry developed is called, he called, brain fingerprinting. Um, so it's not the only one around, but it certainly looks to be the best. So um, this is uh, last year we had uh, got some funding from the New Zealand Law Foundation and this allowed us to, to make a visit to Seattle to see Larry in, in, in person and have a talk to him, see the whole brain fingerprinting thing in operation. Um, and so this is uh, Deborah over here on the left being uh, tested with the, just measuring one EEG from one point at the, at the vertex of the brain. And uh, so she had measuring responses to stimuli on the screen that we saw like before, and this is Larry over here actually doing the tests.
So <clears throat> the important thing about this, as we saw in, in the, as Robin mentioned, and also Larry mentioned in, in his video, is that there are three types of stimuli, and are these that we have to present to the, to the person. So the one at the top we call the probe, and this is the one that only the information from the crime scene, which only the perpetrator would know. And it's also information which someone who wasn't at the crime scene, they wouldn't know it. So this, that's the key one, the probe is the key one. Um, and also the, the perpetrator will also deny knowledge of being at the crime scene, of course, that's another part of it. The second category is this irrelevant um, uh, stimuli. So these are things that are not related to the crime, but um, they can be plausible. So, for example, it might be of a, of a knife or something like that, um, but in fact, unless only the perpetrator will actually know that it's uh, related to the, to the crime scene, everyone else will consider it to be uh, an irrelevant. They can't make any distinguishing point about that. The third category is this target, which we saw before, so the target is, or is related to the crime scene, but you make, make sure that everyone knows about it. So you get, so when it comes up, you get a very positive response, that P300, and, and we know that it's related to the crime, but then everyone knows it, so therefore it doesn't really tell you anything about it. But it's, the important part is that it's a calibration. It's a very important part of the process. So what we do, <coughs> the procedure is, is that we present the stimuli every, every three seconds. There's a stimulus comes up for 300 milliseconds. We just measure the EEG at one potential, at one electrode, although we could do it at, at several, but one seems to be enough. And then we average um, for each of those stimuli about a, a thousand responses to be able to get the Final sort of waveform. So you need to. That's a lot of. That's a lot of average. A lot of stimuli you've got to do to get this to get a reasonably clean waveform. And then we do sort of the basic thing we're really trying to say is um, when you do those three stimuli, those three responses, uh, which is the the is the probe one, the response to the probe closer to the response for the targets or closer to the responses for the irrelevance. That's the key question. So you do lots of you can do lots of correlations and you can do subcategories etc cetera, etc, cetera. but this allows us to see whether in fact um, the as I say the probe is closer to the target or the uh, irrelevance. So you tend to do a thousand times um, random uh, comparisons, and if 90% or more of those are the probe is closer to the target, we say that the, the information is on the brain. And if it's, if it's, uh, if you find that in fact it's closer to the irrelevance in more than 70% of cases, quite arbitrarily decide that that in fact the information is not on the brain. And if it's somewhere in between, we say, well, it's indeterminate and, and we, we the, the, the test can't really determine any more than that. So these are the, um, this is just what we've seen before. Basically, this is a sort of an example of um, the three categories where there are two presidents who happen to, to be into stamp collecting, and you've got to figure out uh, which one it is. Um, so you're told in the top one that, that, that one of them is definitely George Washington. So you know that, uh, but you're not told who the other person is. So when, if you happen to know that it's Bill Clinton, that's fine, and so your response will be closer to the target at the top, but if you don't know it, it's going to be closer to the irrelevant, which can be some, uh, whatever name, uh, or some other president who is not into stamp collecting. Now, we've already been introduced to these um, two high, two other uh, high profile cases in the United States, um, and so we'll just have, we'll, we'll go back to those and we can have a look at some of their results. So this is the JB grinder that Robin introduced before. And remember, here's the person who was, after 15 years, he was felt to be, um, the police couldn't get enough evidence to show that he was guilty of the, of the murders that he'd been accused of. But anyway, they managed to, uh, because, he, because of his arrogance, whatever, um, they managed to convince him that he give this test and that'll prove that you're innocent. 
Um, he said, oh, well, I'll do it. So here are his responses. So this is the response to the target stimulus. So this is the one that, that everyone knows, knows that it's part of the, of the crime. So it's not surprising that he, he gets a response. And if we show the irrelevant, so nothing to do with the crime scene, this is the, this is the irrelevant that we get here. So we get those two here. <clears throat> and the question is, the probe comes next, where is it going to be? Um, and as you see here with the blue one, the, the blue one really follows reasonably closely to the red one, which is the target. And this really illustrated that this information to do with the crime scene was in uh, Grinder's brain. Um, so, as a result of that test, it was considered that the information was present in his brain to do with the murder scene. Um, and as Robin indicated, he subsequently uh, confessed, pleaded guilty, and was sentenced to life in prison. Good choice on his part. And here is the other one that Robin mentioned, which was Terry Harrington. So he had been in prison for 23 years, um, and when they found out about this brain fingerprinting, they thought they'd give it a go. So here are his responses. So this is information showing the responses from the, from the murder scene. That's the, the target stimuli, so you expect to get the response. That's what he got from his the green one is the irrelevant, so nothing to do with basically a sort of flat line. And there is the the blue one is the, the key one to the to the probe uh, to do with the murder scene, showing that he didn't know anything about the murder scene. He hadn't been there. So it was determined that um, his information was absent. Um, that information was actually uh, used and was a considered to be admissible in, in court, and he was subsequently released. And you've already seen this nice photo um, when Harrington was uh, finally released. Now we did, um, Larry came here uh, December last year and uh, gave some talks, and we decided we'd just do a sort of a bit of a pilot study as well, just to actually see, see the real thing. So we didn't have any criminals, but we had two very, um, very keen law students who we um, decided they would be our two subjects. And so both of these two uh, law students told stories, not to Larry directly, um, but in fact to Robin, <coughs> who got all the information. And the first, first law student was Callum. And Callum, um, his story was to do with a wedding that he had been to at the start of the year. So he told all sorts of details. It was a sort of trivial type of information about this, this wedding. Um, and this was his response. So it, it, it was chosen that, in fact, that, that the wedding would actually be the crime. Okay, so this is, this is the response, and this is what we got uh, from Callan. Um, and as we see, so the green one is the irrelevant, but the target is the red one. And as you can see, the probe to do with the wedding came just spot on, <coughs> just, just amazing. Very, very accurate, indicating that, that Callan was definitely the person who knew all the facts about the wedding and was at the wedding. Then we had the, the other student, um, was Emma, and this, so this is Emma's response. So she wasn't at the wedding, um, and so she, this is the response that she gave. So here we have, again, here's the target up here, and the green one is the irrelevant and the probe and you can see the, the blue one is sort of sitting right on the irrelevant indicating very clearly that in fact um, Emma, Emma was not at that wedding so it was quite a good sort of nice local sort of study indicating that um, that this technique really uh, sort of works very well so how effective is uh, brain fingerprinting well Larry has conducted sort of field studies um, and lab studies. There's about 60 of them in total and about 270 individuals. And if he uses just that P300 alone, so that's going out to 900 milliseconds, he found that he had no false positives, no false negatives, uh, but about 12% of the people were indeterminate. So he couldn't quite figure out. There was no mistakes, but he just couldn't indeterminate. But if he went, in fact, took it out a bit further, 
1,800 milliseconds, just a longer response, he found that he was able to get no false positives, no false negatives, uh, and all of there was no indeterminates. So in every one of those results, um, he was able to get the, where he knew what the gold standard was, he was able to um, get a, 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 the correct result. So it's highly resistant to countermeasure, as opposed to the polygraph, if you know how to, how to trick the polygraph. And um, Larry has this running test, which you might like to sort of try when he comes um, starting to out next year again. Um, he's offering 100k US for anyone who in fact can, can fool the system. So uh, roll up and put your names in if you want to give it a go. Um, and it has been, as we showed, has been shown admissible in some cases in, in the States. So the advantages of forensic brainwave analysis is that it's highly accurate, because it's never been proven wrong in Larry's case. Um, highly resistant to countermeasures. It has wide potential applications for forensic, of course, but it's also civil cases, financial cases, um, and even it can be encountered to terrorism type cases as well. So there's lots of potential applications. Uh, but it does have limitations, and one of them is that you need quite a few probes. He thinks a minimum of six. So, so from the crime scene, you've got to get have various probes and also targets. So you've got to get, a, get those all together. The a big one is that the test takes anyway, sort of sometimes between three to five hours. Well, I mean, it's colossal because that's the number of averages you've got to do to get these waveforms. So you also need to have substantial pre-test um, preparation to get the probes and the targets and all that stuff. And the, the actual testers for the forensic brain wave analysis, it's quite a substantial sort of training process. And, and probably a key, a key sort of um, limitation at the moment uh, we feel, and other feel too, is that you know, all these results have been come from, from Larry himself. So um, I think he, he's the real McCoy. But just say he, he, he himself was a con man, for example, then we need, in the scientific verification, we need independent replication. And that, that's, um, that, that's what we, we feel is, is, is needed. Uh, although I believe very strongly that it's, it's, uh, the, um, it's not the real God. So, uh, final for my slides is that um, we want to look at potentially some scientific research into this area um, because it sort of raises questions about, okay, this is it's what it's basically doing. It's, it's basically looking to see is, is that it's a memory thing. So, uh, is memory affected by certain brain disorders, you know, such as head injury, stroke, or Alzheimer's, whatever, all, all those sorts of things. And also, is it affected by alcohol? So if you're severely inebriated at the time of the crime, and, and it's by pot on the cards, um, does that affect their memory of being at the crime scene when you go test them a, a week later sort of thing? So we don't know that for sure. Um, and what about the time? So if, if you measure them a week later, is the information there on the brain that was encoded at the time of the crime scene? And what if you measure them a year later? Um, we, we don't know. Um, and there's the possibilities. What happens if you can, is it possible to manipulate uh, the, the memories so that if the police were basically uh, trying to pin, pin a crime on someone, if they gave them the, the information about the probes, but sort of pretending that it was uh, something else, <coughs> they could manipulate the results. So we have to sort of see to what extent it can be manipulated. Um, and Deborah will come on to some of that as well. And there's also the susceptibility to countermeasures, which we still need to look at as to how can you affect, can you alter your P300 if you know how to think about it in a certain way, for example. And so we're hoping with those, uh, the ones with the, 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 the red arrows, if we, we've got a funding application now, which we're very hopeful to get, but we'll see. Uh, and if we do, we are aiming to to probe those particular uh, questions uh, in terms of the scientific side of things. And there are other things that we can do with, um, to do with the test itself. Can we reduce the number of probes? Can we make it 
can we make it shorter? What happens if some of the probes are very fuzzy because it's dark, that sort of thing? There's lots of sort of questions about the whole thing um, which have not been answered so far. My sort of take on it is that the, the technique is very robust, but we, we have to demonstrate that. Um, and at that point, I'll uh, leave it over to Deborah to take it on. I want you to imagine that you're all sitting on a jury. Right? This is a murder trial. And you've just heard Professor Jones giving evidence about the use of forensic brainwave analysis and a test that was undergone by the person who's been accused of murder. So he gives his evidence. As a defence lawyer, I stand up and say, it's all crap. None of the science is accurate. He's just shown you a couple of pretty little coloured lines. He's used a lot of big words, and that's all there is to it. Who do you believe? There's a phenomenon called the CSI effect and it's well documented amongst juries. And basically what it does is it, it suggests that juries are convinced by exactly what Professor Jones just gave you. Right? If you show a lot of pretty colours, a lot of charts with different coloured lines, and you use a lot of big scientific words, it becomes very convincing. Right? And people are more likely to convict if you see those pretty colours than if those pretty colours are not there, even if the same information is being given. Right? So we know that you can influence jurors by pretty colours and lots of big words. That makes the introduction of science into criminal law something that we need to be very careful about. In 1984, DNA was used for the first time in a criminal investigation. And a scientist stood up in court and said, well, this guy did not do it, here's the DNA evidence to prove it. The police spoke to the media afterwards and they said, what are we supposed to do? You know, you've got the science guy who says 100%, this guy who's accused did not do it. We don't know how the hell it works, we can't do anything about it. That's kind of the situation that I would feel like I'd be in as, as a defence lawyer. All I can do is stand up and say, well, that's wrong. But you've seen his pretty colours and his big words, and he's a lot more convincing than the poor defence lawyer who goes, I don't know if it works or not. One person says it does. So one of the things that we're looking at in this project, first of all, it's got to be accurate. Right, we're not putting our names anywhere near this project until we're sure that it actually does what Professor Farwell says it does. Right, but then the next question is, should we be using it? Just because science has the ability to perhaps tell us something and it seems accurate, doesn't mean that we should necessarily be using it. Right, and that's why we've got a whole bunch of lawyers on the team. So it goes beyond just, is this scientifically accurate? to what are the legal, social, cultural, ethical implications of using technology such as this. Because even if it is 100% accurate, that doesn't necessarily mean that as a society this is something that we are willing to accept. Right, so we started off in our pilot project by sort of starting to look at what are these issues? What are some of the reasons why we may not just even want to touch this, even if it does seem to be accurate? And what we're going to do as the project goes on is look at these in a bit more detail and say, well, how serious are these? Are there legal concerns that suggest that we should just not touch this, even if it does seem like it is pretty close to 100% accurate? We have to be very careful when we introduce science. Things that we laugh about today were seen as scientifically accurate 100 years ago. Right? They used to look at somebody's head, and if there was a bump there, it meant you were a murderer. Right, today we think it's a joke. A hundred years ago they convicted and executed people because of that. So my role in the team is a little bit of a cynic. I've got to provide the, the counterbalance. In India, they've been using a technique kind of similar to this since about 2003. And between 2003 and 2009, they used this technique in, on over 300 people in the course of investigating crimes. Right, and it seemed to be successful. They got convictions in many cases. Um, in 2008, this was the primary evidence used to convict a 24-year-old of killing her ex fiance by feeding him a McDonald's burger. Now, it did have a bit of arsenic added to it, but, but they used the brain fingerprinting and they were able to, to show her a picture of the Big Mac and she recognised it, and they showed her arsenic and she recognised it, and she went to jail for it. In 2010, the Indian Supreme Court was asked whether this technique was appropriate or not. Right? They'd become aware that it was being used a lot in crime investigations. 
They just wanted to see the legal implications of it. And the Indian Supreme Court was less than excited. They were particularly less than thrilled with the Indian police's argument that was, hey, this technique is less invasive than beating the hell out of someone to find out if they committed a crime or not. <laughs> That's true, said the, police, said the court, doesn't actually mean we should allow this as well. So they ended up allowing it, but under very, very restricted circumstances. And in that case, they, they have an interesting discussion about the rights of the people that are being forced to undergo this particular testing. So we've all seen enough crime TV to know that when you're arrested, you get rights read to you, right? You have the right to remain silent, you have the right to an attorney, et cetera, et cetera. These rights have been around for thousands of years, right? The right to remain silent. If the police are investigating me for murder, I don't have to help them out, right? I can simply say, stay silent. I can refuse to give them a statement. If they want to find me guilty of murder, they've got to do it. I'm not helping them out, right? So let's imagine that I am arrested for murder, right? The police sit me down, they interrogate me, and I'm like, I'm not going to say anything. They then say, look, we've got this technique. It's 100% accurate. If you haven't committed the murder, you've got nothing to hide, right? Nothing to hide, nothing to fear. Just do this test. We'll get rid of you as a suspect, and we'll move on. And I think, well, I didn't do it. I'm sick of being questioned. Let's just do the test, get it over and done with, and I can go home. So I do the test, and they come back and they say, you're guilty. And I'm like, what? No, I'm not. And they say, look, we've got this test. All right? so they charge me with murder, and all of a sudden I'm in front of the court. Now, they want to use the results of the brain fingerprinting test against me. They want to put those fancy little graphs up on the screen and say, look, she did it. Her brain's telling us that she did it. Now, I have a right to remain silent. I have the right not to testify against myself, not to self-incriminate in court. Can I turn around and say, there's no difference between me getting up on a witness stand and saying I didn't do it, and you putting up a picture of my brain that says I did or didn't do it, right? Both of that is me incriminating myself or not. So, Sorry, police, you cannot use the results of the brain scan because I have a right not to self-incriminate. Sounds like a reasonable argument, right? The police response would be a little bit different. The police would say, let's look at where this right came from. It developed over 2,000 years ago. It's about you not making a statement. It's about you not saying or writing something down to tell us that you did this or not, right? This is completely different. This isn't you making a deliberate choice to speak or not to speak. It's simply, here's a result that says your brain recognises something or not. It's not covered by the right to self-incrimination. Okay, maybe the police have a point, maybe they don't. The police would probably go on and say, actually the right is just purely restricted to things that you say. Because while your entire body does not have to get up on the witness stand and testify against you, Bits of your body can testify against you and do so all the time, right? Drink driving, for example. You get pulled over under suspicion of drink driving, they give you a breath test. You breathe into a machine. If you fail it, your breath gets used against you in court, right? DNA. Committing a crime, you drop a bit of blood at the crime scene, you touch something, your, your skin is left behind. That DNA is allowed to testify against you. An argument that my, my blood that was found on the murder weapon can't give evidence in court because of self-incrimination would not be believed. So bits of me can testify against me in court. And the police will say, well, this is no different. This is just a bit of you being your brain testifying. It's not covered by the right against self-incrimination. Ah, I would say, though. But everything you've just described is bits of me, bits that I've abandoned. I've given away my breath, I've dropped blood at the crime scene, I've left fingerprints. And because I've put them at the crime scene or touched something, that's no longer part of me. Right, so if I choose to abandon stuff, I've been playing this pen for a while now, if I leave that there, I can't do anything if someone comes and takes that and gets my fingerprints off it because I've abandoned that by leaving it behind. 
I haven't abandoned my brain. I like my brain. It's still in me. Right, so therefore my brain is different to fingerprints and DNA. Hell, says the judge, what do I do with this? Right, this is where the law and science get really interesting. Right, you've got these ancient rights that somehow have to address modern situations, and we don't know if they can or not. And so that's kind of my role on the team. So we're going to stop there, and we're going to allow you guys to ask any questions for a couple of minutes. So if you have a question. Just before we do that, um, we've got a very serious business trader in the audience, and we'd like to bring to your attention. So Callan over here was the person that was at that wedding, that, that dastardly wedding that we talked about before, and uh, you saw his results. So he was definitely mm. guilty. Um, and, and Callan is just going to give you just a very quick overview of, of some of the, the pointers that he had when he went through the test and what he was thinking and what he was actually actually trying to do at the time. Cool, yeah, so um, I'm the criminal that attended the wedding. Um, so, I mean, you've, you guys have seen most of, of what the procedure involves um, in the video before. The main thing that I'd probably highlight that we didn't see is that before the trials begin, um, you get shown a list of every single piece of stimuli that's going to be um, involved. So if there was potential for um, a, a corrupt police officer to maybe drop a few words that would later be used <coughs> in the, um, the test itself to, to maybe produce um, false incrimination, uh, you'd, you'd be able to say, I recognise that, and, and um, it would be taken out of the test. Um, another thing is, I don't know if anyone was wondering what those X's that came up after every single trial were about. Um, basically, whenever you move, your, your body's creating electrical currents, um, to, and that's, that's essentially what, what um, is being measured. Uh, so what, what happens is, is the, the words will flash up, um, you have to stay perfectly still while that's happening, and uh, when the X happens, you're allowed to blink, you're allowed to breathe, uh, breathe you're allowed to do whatever you want. Um, but those are the two main things that that weren't really addressed. Um, I, I was part of the research team on the, the science side of, um, of what we did over summer, and before we went through these um, these trials with Dr. Farwell, we, we met as a team and we sort of discussed some concerns that we might have had with, with um, how it all works. Uh, so, first of all, I mean, I did try actively to uh, deceive the test. Um, I was trying my best to avoid um, clicking yes to stuff that I did know, um, but the difference between something that you're told that you're supposed to know and then something that you actually do know can be quite hard to um, discern between when you're in the heat of the moment. Um, and so because of that, I just lost track of, um, of, of what I was supposed to know and, and my, my brain was just producing exactly what I remembered. Um, another concern that we had is that, um, as you saw in the video before, there's just words that flash up, and um, maybe there was something to do with pictures that could flash up that would, that would actually influence what, what you saw. But I found that even though they were words, um, pictures of what the word represented appeared straight in my brain straight away. Um, even some of the, the words were misspelled, or there were slight variations on spelling, such as like surnames and stuff. Um, and it still elicited you saw the graph, the same responses from my brain. Um, a further sort of thing that we were worried about is that uh, it wasn't a, the best representation of time is that sort of every block of trials takes about 10 minutes to do and you're constantly repeating through cycles, random cycles, but cycles nonetheless of the same words. Um, and so and a concern we had is that once you have been doing it for a while, your brain would just start to recognise stuff anyway because you keep seeing it over and over again. Uh, but there was, there was enough time between each um, set of questions that you kind of forgot what you were doing and I can imagine if it was an actual criminal um, investigation the stress would probably get to you and you wouldn't really be able to remember most of those. Um, I think that's, that's about everything. <laughs>